Hello and welcome to the Broadcast News Wrap, breaking down the biggest TV topics so you don't have to. It's summer holiday time, and for any parents facing up to six weeks of their children being glued to the screen, we've got the essential lowdown on the children's TV world. Join myself, Jetty Whittock, BBC in-house lead Helen Bullo, and Serious Lunch's Genevieve Dexter as we explore. And later, the News Wrap is delighted to welcome special guest Connie Huck, the Blue Peter maestro, who joins Hannah Bowler 25 years on from her debut on the legendary children's format. All that, plus much more, on this week's Broadcast News Wrap. So welcome uh, to this week's Broadcast News Wrap, and we're focusing on the kids' TV sector. Uh, we've got two fantastic guests joining us. I'm going to introduce them briefly. So Helen Bullo is the BBC's in-house lead for kids' TV production, uh, along with also working across radio and education. Uh, she oversees some of CBBC and CBB's biggest brands, uh, and is also readying her division for its upcoming merger with BBC Studios Productions, uh, which we can hopefully go on to a little bit more later in the pod. Uh, Genevieve Dexter, welcome Genevieve. She's worked in kids TV for 25 year years, has a wealth of exec producer credits, including Horrible Science and Messy Goes to Hokkaido. She is the chief executive of both Serious Lunch, a kids TV distribution operation, and I Present, an IP development and animation studio based in London. So thank you so much for joining us this week. Amazing. So I wanted to start by being quite broad. Uh, where do you see the health of the kids TV landscape at the moment? Helen, maybe you want to kick us off. I could do. I mean, it's, a, it's an interesting time for that interesting question, isn't it, Max? I think, you know, I'm going to say as a producer, the first thing I'm going to say is in terms of our health, um, that I think we've all been through one of the most difficult periods that any of us could ever have imagined in terms of production. I mean, I, I've been a producer for over 30 years, and I think that the challenges of um, working in a pandemic have been, you know, almost unimaginable, whether that's in-house or indie, scripted or unscripted, all across the UK. Um, and yet no one has sort of faltered in their progress or their responsibilities. Um, so I think that the initial disruption of the pandemic, followed by those necessarily script protocols, everything being rescheduled, the need to remain kind of constantly vigilant at all times. I just literally take my hat off um, at the moment to an industry that's shown the most enormous grit, you know, creative grit, facing the youngest audience with the biggest demands in a time like that, keeping people safe and making great content. So, so I just sort of wanted to sort of note that really. Um, and then I would say sort of on a slightly broader scale, the thing that we've we've noted before as well is that you know it's becoming increasingly competitive in the the kids TV market with many global players and from a BBC point of view that's why we think it's even more important that we continue to be distinctive and offer UK kids something different that reflect UK kids and their passions and their needs and then there's the how that audience is behaving so that continued debate and discussion the support for linear, the, the resourcing and the investment in on-demand and how we continue to nurture the peaceful coexistence of linear channels and a growing kind of on-demand ecosystem, as it were. In a nutshell, Max, I think that sums up where we are at the moment. <laughs> yeah, I think that, that's a really good summary, actually. And you've, you've touched on a lot of what um, Jesse and myself wanted to talk to you guys about. Um, Genevieve, how about you? Would, would, would you kind of second that almost or, or, or are there other big things at play? I think, I think it's really important to recognise where we are, you know, because we're so deep into this pandemic. I don't think we've really started to, um, to analyse what's, what's happened. Um, I think we've basically been acting a little bit like Rhubarb in these three pictures here, uh, <laughs> basically trying to get, trying to swim our way through the, the thing, but I agree that everybody has been amazing in being able to deliver the shows um, re regardless. I mean, I know I was speaking to, uh, to, to Wild Seed and I think they had to stop production three times and do three insurance claims um, in, one, in one production. And I guess the, you know, the pandemic has had winners and losers across the board. And, and perhaps, you know, it's worth noting that animation um, is possibly, you know, the, the, the winner. Um, so we've had a, a pandemic baby 
um, in the name of Best and Bester. And I've never met any of the, the either the director or the producer, or, you know, it's like we've never known anything better. <laughs> and it's quite interesting to see how the boom in animation is also now creating a, uh, a shortage of supply. So, um, so for example, you know, people just can't, they can't crew up enough talent um, and, and particularly in the UK can't crew up enough talent because of, because of Brexit. So there's, there's health, but then there's, there's strains, you know, that, 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 that imbalance between animation and live action is, is, has been uh, created by the pandemic. Genevieve, that's something we hear often about drama, not enough crew to go around and, and, and so much demand for content. But is that something that's really sort of permeating into the kids space? And where would you say within the kids space, it's kind of where, where is it really biting the most? I, I can only really speak kind of ane anecdotally, you know, in, in that we were discussing a Canadian co-production recently and the Canadian co-producer, who we thought would like to do the animation, declined because they just can't find enough, just can't find enough people. So we've had to completely turn the, you know, turn the co-production structure around to move to move the animation to the Canaries, where they do have the resources. So it's almost like you're you're doing a sweep of the world to find out where there is capacity and where there isn't where there isn't capacity. But you've, you, you, you touched on Best and Bester, uh, which is your new show. Tell us a little bit about that and how it came together. So, um, so that's a co-production between I Present, um, Gigglebug in Finland and Nelvana in Canada, and it's the first ever uk Finnish Canadian co-production. <laughs> <laughs> well, people keep telling me I'm making history, but it doesn't, it doesn't kind of feel like that right now. Um, you know, because normally we would have been to Finland, you know, two or three times and Canada a couple of times. And so um, it is tough, you know, when there's, when there's problems, it, 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 it it's tougher, but, um, but we are, we are, as I say, we're a COVID baby. We're on, we're on schedule, we're on production. Everything seems to be going well and we'll be delivering to Viacom, um, next next year next next fall so that you know that that's exciting for us and um and we've also been you know sort of you know crewing up against uh, you know against a, a diversity remits both being directed by nickelodeon and by varna and, and part, part of that is you know is voluntary but also that that diversity is becoming much more uh, much more integrated with, with the with the production process so that's 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 been a good journey too and um, what about yourself Helen so so from in from an in-house production point of view it's, it's probably best if I if I stay where I'm kind of most familiar you, you know this anyway that outside animation um, we make the majority of our our productions drama and unscripted between March and October every year and and this year is is no exception so it's busy you know we've got some catch-up filming going on um things that we had to delay a whole 12 months so we've just started making our second season of Get Even which is a an, an older skewing kids drama that we make for um iPlayer and Netflix that's just gone back in in Bolton um for its second season because we missed our window last year so we've got some catch-up We've got some brand new um, unscripted shows going on at the moment. So for some reason, we're also in Bolton because uh, it has the best infrastructure um, and buildings in terms of filming for a new unscripted show that we've got called Britain's Best Young Artist. And it's going to be fabulous because it does exactly what it says on the tin. And the kids are amazing. I mean, the, the grown up presenters are great and we've got some marvellous guest judges, but the kids themselves and their skill and talent is just extraordinary. So, so we've got dramas shooting in, in Scotland. We've got um, Princess Mirabelle in Scotland, which we're all really excited about. A lovely magical story that's an adaptation from the Julia Donaldson books. Um, so that's taking shape really beautifully in, in Scotland. Um, other drama production happening in the Northwest. Um, and as I say, you know, the, the unscripted shows are all out filming. We're, we're creating dream dens at the moment from the top of Scotland to the bottom of England. Um, and uh, and we've got, of course, Blue Peter and Mashup on every week. So so this is a really kind of, I'd say, hot spot if it wasn't 31 degrees and melting outside. <laughs> but it's busy. You know, it is busy. And um, in animation, we're making 
lots more episodes of Jojo and Grand Grand, which, you know, just to echo what Genevieve was saying about, you know, the importance of diversity at the moment and the, the ongoing search for new voices and authentic storytelling. Um, Jojo and Grand Grand is a really good example of that, I think. Um, and also, you know, children's following through on its commitment to ordering more episodes sooner of the things that are striking a real chord um, with families as well. So as producers, we're very grateful for that commitment. Thank you very much indeed. That was lovely. Um, so in a nutshell, I would say, you know, across all of the genres, it's busy at the moment. Lots of new live action titles coming through from the indies as well. You know, Dodger, um, second seasons of Mallory Towers, you know, lots and lots of good titles, um, but busy. And as Genevieve says, you know, the industry stretched, you know, drama, it's tricky. It, I think, you, you know, you've covered it you know, line producers and producers and execs there, you know, it's a stretched craft base at the moment. Um, so, so we're all doing our best, um, you know, to, to come up with the best things that we can to tempt the best talent to come to us. I feel for, you know, new producers trying to come into the market because they're, you know, they're not having those opportunities of mixing um, and mingling at the markets and, and having that, those sort of chance meetings that, that they might otherwise do but again I think the BBC has got another animation program to encourage short short programming so I, th I think it's important that we all you know keep keep an eye on that because we'll come out of this and there won't be a, <laughs> there won't be any new voices because we'll just be had our heads down doing you know dealing with the people that we know and the projects that we're already in, involved with you know Mm, yeah, and it sounds really tricky. I, I recognised what you were saying, Helen, about everything gets delayed and then it sort of ma makes the pipeline quite messy. And, and I think that's interesting what you were saying, Genevieve, about how that, that then impacts smaller producers coming into the game. But I also, it does feel like animation could, could potentially have a real drive um, from the pandemic for, for a variety of reasons. And, and Helen, the BBC is looking into this, isn't it? So Patricia Hidalgo uh, has launched this new scheme um, and is looking for vaguely the next UK Simpsons, right? And I remember, did she, what did she describe it as? Yeah, um, she, talked, she talked about that when she arrived, is not it? Yeah, you know, this, is a real, yeah. this is a real passion of Patricia's. Mm. Um, and uh, as, as Genevieve says, so this was something that Patricia announced at CMC and it's, it's called the Ignite Initiative. So, so basically it's the BBC investing quite a significant amount of money to, to find and develop that next UK animation hit. You know, so, so, you know, very much looking for things that reflect the lives of UK kids and travel at the same time. The idea is that up to 20 ideas could be given an initial funding part and then further fundings secured at stages two and three for submissions that make it through each round. You know, uh, Genevieve and I know this too well, you know, it's a long, expensive process doing animation development, isn't it, Genevieve? And then that can be a barrier. You know, it can be a real barrier in terms of the money or the networks or the access to commissioning. So I think this is a real good sort of, as I say, it's something that Patricia has been passionate about since she started. Mm -hmm. And 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 this, I think, is just its commitment. It's a, it's a good opportunity for all of us. In-house in is busy meeting people and eliciting ideas from people at the moment because it's exciting to have mm -hmm. these kind of opportunities. And 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 the, the and the resulting shorts from that because we we as we as animation producers have found it difficult um, accessing you know new new ideas and 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 developing them just because that is that is such a difficult thing to do remotely you know I I actually pitching I actually quite like doing on Zoom. Um, you know, rather than trying to find a chair in a cafe and, uh, <laughs> you know, and everybody's late and it's all very pressured in the Zoom, it's quite, it's quite, uh, it's quite relaxed, but, but development is really, is really tough. And, you know, I don't know if the, those BBC shorts would be a, a destination for other producers to go to look at, to look at working with those people or whether that's in, intended as an internal project base. How do you get local, national, global? You know, how do you encourage creatives in a particular place to be supported and to have that enduring, iconic thing? And we always say this, you know, you can't develop a landmark series. It's up to the audience to decide if it's a landmark or not. But you can aspire to that level of ambition. And, um, and that's exciting. I think that is exciting. Mm. But backed up with money. That's the important thing. Backed up with a bit of money. As, as always, as always. <laughs> 
it sounds it sounds like a really good scheme in the sense of being able to maybe help some of the smaller companies coming through as well who may not end up winning but but still gain from development funding and, and from experience and whatnot i really liked when when patricia announced it uh, sort of trailed it a few months ago uh, and she said it would be rooted in uk culture about roast beef instead of turkey so that was a good i feel like that that <laughs> says so much <laughs> beyond the food stuffs that are mentioned yes i think so i think we might have a few vegan meals in there as well though <laughs> excellent <laughs> excellent it is, well, it is it is such a shame that there isn't more you know animation in the uk because you know for for family because when we've at serious lunch we've tried to import series so for example we were trying to um import some some you know one of the most famous japanese um animated uh sort of family series which is called shinchan which is basically the japanese simpsons um the response from everybody is oh we've we've got family guy or we've got the simpsons or we've got um you know family you know family guy american dad and so on so we don't we don't need anything else um and that's you know, and that's that's a that's a great shame. So it's great to hear that you know there's there are ambitions for that. And we I think we have tried in the UK a number of times to to do this over the years, but I don't think we've ever seemed to have cracked it. So it'll be exciting to to follow that story. The other thing I'd say that really has over the past few years, uh, if we look beyond the pandemic and 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 the sort of the uh the the production issues that everyone is facing is clearly the uh, arrival in a very big way of the streaming services uh into kids television now i'll start with you genevieve um in terms of the the netflixes the amazons the the, the big uh buyers of kids tv and the big commissions for kids tv um who broadly have you have you felt uh, have offered the most opportunity and, and and where have you been trying to target that that sort of SVOD world what's what's been your approach well I think I think in the um sort of in the as a as a in my distribution hat on in 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 the early days it was great because the Amazon was doing you know very big single territory deals or two or three territory deals as acquisition and then that model's swiftly gone to, you know, you know, paying for everything and 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 owning more and owning more and more. And the acquisition level has really sort of dropped away, especially you know, second second window, and the money has got you know much less interesting. So I think I think I think for us it's become you know less and less of less and less opportunity since since they first since they first launched. I think if you want if you want them to fully fund your series. And then you're left with, you know, a, a few rights, and and that's what you're interested in. Then great, but if you're interested in intellectual property and long-running intellectual property that gets commissioned again and again, you know, you're better off with the BBC. Fair, fair enough. <laughs> it's good to know, Helen. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you know, if, if you if you want to have longevity, you know, for your for your for your brand absolutely because because there's so much uh, around um the sort of financial aspects of kids television that goes beyond the commission of a tv program right it's the exploitation of the of, of the ip around it really isn't it that that kind of makes the business model properly work if you want to make some proper money out of your your show and, and that that is more and more restricted um as they go forward but I mean, there's been a new initiative from amazon recently called you know amazon is it Kids Plus, um, which has sort of really ignited those acquisitions again, so, you know, because they moved out of kids, you know, sort of famous, you know, famous uh, announcement at the time, and there was a lot of fallout from that. Um, and then most recently, they've they've announced a new app, and they and they are now you know buying for those apps. So there's been a bit of a resurgence there, uh, which which we've benefited from, but. Um, but you know nothing like in the in the early days. From a from a program maker's point of view, I would say, you know, um, there's been competition around for quite a long time. You know, Disney and Nick and Cartoon Network, they've been here for a long time. They make great shows, and and Netflix and Apple, um, you know, they're newer. They make great shows as well. So so I think there's there's absolutely no doubt that there's more competition for kids' attention. Two things. One is that as producers I think that keeps you sharp you know I, I think you know that that we co collectively all keep up each other's bars high 
but also and you know you know i will say this but i say it because i mean it as much as what the lanyard around my neck says i, I think it's it's it makes it even more important for us to do something distinct and valuable so i think you know great shows elsewhere and come to the bbc to see great shows and uk kids seeing themselves and their passions reflected everywhere you know from from mr tumble and the something special strands to the amazing my life docs that we do so i think you know it might sound a bit trite to say that there is room for us all but you know the kids tv industry is a specialist industry it's important to have strong competition and it's also important that everybody's clear that they're they're offering something distinct and and then you let this very discerning audience choose and that's what keeps you on your metal as well I could completely agree that the BBC re remains by far and away the biggest commissioner of kids content, but potentially the Young Audiences Content Fund, which I wanted to talk about briefly, has sort of maybe balanced those scales ever so slightly. It's a fund that has mainly been used by CITV, by Channel 5's Milkshake, by some, you know, S4C and and a couple of, of others from, from around the UK. Genevieve first, maybe, uh, what, has, what has been the impact of, of the Young Audiences Content Fund on the landscape? Well, I, th I think it's been it's been very interesting from um, a, a sort of distribution acquisition point of view, because some of the projects that we we love uh, have have you know ended up ended up getting getting made when I when I think that otherwise they really wouldn't have got made. Um, I mean, if you look at the um, circle, some some of the projects coming out of um, um, Eagle versus Bat or um, the, the Sound Collect uh, um, Circle Square, that, that you know those projects we've been tracking for a long time, and they just wouldn't have got made without the YACF. And so um, it really is, you know, doing what it what it what it should do, and the application process is, um, you know, is lengthy and ensures that. You know, really, you know, and Jackie would, if Jackie was here, she would be, uh, you know, talking about how she's how she's designed it to to do that, and and I think it's been very sort of skillfully um, crafted, but obviously suffered some uh, some some cutbacks recently. Mm. Mm. And and Helen, presumably, you know, so so the BBC doesn't apply to the fund. It's taken out of unallocated license fee income, and clearly was meant more for the commercial players. Um, but presumably, you've still welcomed that kind of shot in the arm that the wider children's TV sector has been given. Yes, yes. So you're right. I mean, we we don't have any plans um, to access the fund, or, or you know, and and that's been a position for a good few years but but I would just echo you know what Genevieve was saying about you know for producers to have alternative access to funds you know to make you know what are brilliant public service programming for kids on other channels as well you know we we would just thoroughly applaud the opportunities that it's offered elsewhere um just not something that we have chosen to to access mm. Mm. Yes, it, it, it's basically come in, you know, in place of the, the loss of the loss of advertising because we mm. have this very une, uneven playing field of, you know, sort of the BBC or an extremely difficult route otherwise, you know, because well, other, you know, other than maybe the multi territories like Viacom and, and Warner, where there's you know there's plenty going on there, especially at, especially at, at Warner and Viacom at the moment, so that's a nice route. Um, but in terms of a UK only route, if you've got a project that doesn't suit those multinational channels, you know, going to ITV or Channel 5 and trying to build your budget from, you know, a very low, very low base since the, uh, the demise of the advertising revenue has been a struggle which only the bravest <laughs> have, been, have been able to, to, to face as independents. Mm. Um, and so now it's so it levels the field and there's, there's more content coming out and it's so it's great. Mm -hmm. And so I'd imagine there's a little bit of a concern, you know, it, it's into its third year now. It, it could be relatively close to ending if it doesn't get renewed by the government, which is a decision that I, I know is uh, uh, on the horizon. Um, but do you, do you think, Genevieve, that the structures have been built up enough within these commercial players that now it won't matter too much if the YACF is taken away or, or does it need more time? The YACF has not changed the fact that the, that the commissioning budgets of, of ITV mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and Channel 5 and Channel 4 and S4C have not, have not changed. Um, so if it was removed, then, then we would be back to 
the previous landscape, which is BBC or, um, you know, I wouldn't say bust, but, you know, if you're being given 5% or 10% of a budget and you're trying to build it internationally, it's really hard. Uh, I, I've done it. Um, but, it, you know, if you don't have a kind of a starter base of, you know, 20, 25%, the math just doesn't add up. You know, it doesn't matter which way you look at it and, you know, yeah, how, however inventive you get, you really just can't, you just really just can't get there unless you start making huge sacrifices. Well, that was some searing insight from Genevieve Dexter and Helen Bullough, our guests. But that's not all we've got for you in this Kids TV special. Earlier this week, Hannah Bowler spoke to the legend Connie Huck about her career highs kids staying safe watching content online and her thoughts on how Blue Peter can stay relevant. I wonder whether it would be wise maybe for the BBC to go back to having dedicated tea time kids programming and really plough lots of money into it but it's just a set window rather than sort of having a CBBC channel that has to compete with like Cartoon Network and Disney and a million other channels and, you know, budgets are only getting less. I, I wonder whether it could be more of a talking point TV if you just have really, really sort of high quality, expensive programming in that dedicated slot that maybe could be more sort of, I don't know, family viewing, but maybe I'm totally wrong and that that just wouldn't even work now. I there definitely is something in that, like when, I mean, you just always think of coming back from school. Literally, Blue Peter was yeah. the main show. You on Blue Peter, getting home from school, yeah. having that, and then watching news <laughs> round. And the news would come on, and that was your evening. Yeah, that's absolutely. It. Whereas now, there's almost too much on offer. There's so you're so overwhelmed that you know people just stick to their niches. So I don't know, lots of people will only know the you, their go-to YouTube channel about skateboarding or whatever it is. And I wonder whether, yeah, I don't know, whether you could have, you know, I kind of miss family viewing in, the, in those days of not that many channels. I remember on a Saturday, you know, we would all sit down and watch Wurzel Gummidge or super grand or whatever was that sort of tea time viewing where you think current trends in in kids is heading and obviously you have a lot of books as well uh, you're a very accomplished writer and I've seen a couple there's like one on climate change and a couple of other areas that's obviously quite zeitgeisty at the moment mm. but are there any other mm. kind of topics and themes that kids tv and, and kids publishing is really kind of going in all media I think when it comes to kids has a responsibility to make sure that our kids have values of inclusivity diversity have liberal doses of empathy and altruism because you know kids are shaping and forming in the primary years by the secondary years they're done by your 20s the blueprint is so fixed that by your 30s you need therapy to undo it all so it's massively important you know what we subject our kids to in these early formative years and you know they are better at sort of knowing about recycling and climate change than you know grown-ups their grown-up counterpart which is great because when something strikes a kid in these early years it goes through to their core and they take it with them for life you know the adults that we become are more or less just made in those early years. And I think I only got to my mid-30s before I sort of realised that, that everyone is just such a product of those early years. So, you know, with the books that I do, the first one's all to do with sort of knowledge and education and the, the main characters into science. And, you know, I have this thing that I just hate it, that things just seem to dumb down so much. And I think the way forward is to intelligence up because, you know, as an adult, you crave knowledge almost when you're not at school and you realise that, you know, knowledge and intelligence is cool. But sometimes these stereotypes and the things we're subjected to don't necessarily follow that mantra. And I know that Blue Peter was often seen as sort of worthy mm. and quite educational in some camps. But actually, you know, Blue Peter was ahead of the curve. You know, Blue Peter had Blue Peter appeals before comic relief was even a thing you know blue peter was inclusive and diverse it had a blue peter garden for 
kids that didn't have gardens that lived in high rises you know it showed people how people live in sub-saharan africa or in asia and you know all their making stuff was all to do with recycling and upcycling and mend and make do so it was kind of woke before woke it was really ahead of its time and kids tv in general you know where i didn't see that many brown faces on telly at all you know i had Derek griffiths and floella benjamin you know and actually, that's how it should be. Children's TV has a real responsibility. Children's books, children's telly. It's more important than grown-up telly because grown-ups are done, whereas children are shaping and forming. And if they all have altruism and empathy, then the world can only be a better place. No matter where they go, they'll want to make sure the world is a better place and then the future's bright. Really well put. Do you think telly's holding up to that quite well at the moment? Or do you think there's some areas that it's that's kind of failing in all it's difficult to know i hope so i sincerely hope so might be a good point to to kind of take a moment to look back over your time in um kids tv presenting serum blue peter from 1997 2008 is that is that correct right quite a long time at the helm and it when i was always a big fan of the show and from watching it i always just thought it was so varied, like the, the stuff you yeah. would do one week to the next week. It's just such a mishmash of things and genres and trips. Yeah. Events. And yeah. I wondered kind of what are some of your, your biggest highlights for your, for yeah, your career? I do too. remember just you saying that makes me remember that on like, after just showing the show, you know, one day we had this machine that was, that made snow, that makes snow. And they filled the Blue Peter Garden with snow. And we, you know, were pre-recording this thing in the snow in the morning. And then we had the Wombles in the studio. And I do remember, like, a friend saying, well, what did you do today? <laughs> I was like, well, I had a snowball fight and met the Wombles. And I thought, this is how it's going to be from now on. And it really was, you know. That's why I was in, on it for over 10 years, because never a dull moment. You travel to so many places and you see so many things and you don't just see them superficially, you go behind the scenes. So I went to so many different countries and continents and I don't know, did diving with sharks and, you know, but it goes from, you know, the ridiculous to the sublime and the glamorous to the, you know, one minute you're interviewing the Prime Minister, the next minute you're down a sewer, literally. But I remember that the Sunday, one of the Sunday papers, I think it was Sunday Champs, did a bucket list of 100 things to do before you die. And the the all, the four of us, Blue Peter presenters, were sort of looking through it and we'd literally, between us, done most of the things. I mean, it is the dream job. But for me, the travel was the highlight. Seeing different places how people live in different countries the appeal filming was just amazing I remember doing a film appeal filming with the Red Cross I was a Red Cross ambassador and we did we did an appeal for Angola where they had nearly 30 years of civil war and every family had a person or a child missing or dead and the Red Cross did this tracing project to trace and find people that had gone missing and it's literally like bringing someone back from the dead essentially and returning them to their family you know some of these families hadn't seen their kids in years you know the kids have grown up almost and had just given up on them it's like being a detective agency mm. and they would find these kids and return them and you know I remember I got to go on a reunification it was just so wow. overwhelmingly wow. emotional but you know you get to share sort of special moments and see really special amazing things but yeah i love the variety as well yeah it it was it is the best job in the world do you do you still watch the show cuz i kind of wondered if you do what you kind of see the differences between when you were on it and and how the show kind of runs today i mean i dip in and out and mm. you know it does stay true to its values. It really, you know, when Black Lives Matter, they did that amazing piece that went viral. They, you know, still do appeals and lots of foreign filming and, you know, lots of challenges. And, you know, it's a lot harder for them now because they're in this multi-channel environment and, you know, TV is competing with YouTube and all sorts. But, you know, they are you know, moving with the times. Their latest presenter, I think, is a YouTuber. So, you know, there's a lot of change on the show. 
as well. And yeah, I would say it's going from strength to strength. So Blue Peter aside, you've been on so many different things over your time presenting. I wondered what what are you working on at the moment? And what have you got coming down the line? I've got my third book coming out in the cookie Congratulations. series. Which- which yeah is due to be submitted anytime now I'm literally on deadline at the moment and that's out in in September and then I'm you know doing lots of stuff like children's media conference I've been doing lots of environmental stuff Tesco I've been who you know have got a big environmental drive at the moment um I'm in doing stuff with Kew Gardens where I'm I'm an ambassador. I've been doing bits and pieces of little filming of sort of fun cameo stuff. So I just did a thing during lockdown for a drama which is on Apple TV called Invasion where I'm a a news reporter. I just did a bit for Mandy where I'm a TV presenter. So just lots of sort of varied bits and pieces really. Sounds like a nice time you can kind of just work on lots of different things and lots of time. Yeah well I'm bound by drop offs and pickups because I'm I'm determined to be a hands-on mum. So I tend to just do things between the hours of nine and three in general yeah so that I can get my kids from school and watch them grow up and all of that stuff I thought we would end we wrap up our podcast most times with a little thing where I just ask all of our guests what uh, you've been watching at the moment so I wondered Connie yeah. Huck, what have you been watching at the moment um, I'm currently in the middle of watching Sophie a murder in West Cork which is on Netflix, I, which is a true crime documentary series. Mm. I've just finished watching The Terror, which is rather, which I rather enjoyed. It looked um, scary for me. I don't know why. I just was like, this looks really Yeah, intense. Yeah, it is quite intense, I have to say. And I know people that did give up midway through. But yeah, I, I, I really enjoyed it. So I, I persevered to the end. Finished watching A Teacher, which is on BBC iPlayer. Yeah. Nice. Good little cohort. So True Crime, The Terror and A Teacher. Yes. And my, yeah, my recent watches. Thank you so much for joining me on the podcast today. It was lovely to catch up with you and hear your views on kids TV. So thanks. Pleasure. Lots of money into it, but it's just a set window Rather than sort of having a CBBC channel that has to compete with like Cartoon Network and Disney and a million other channels and, you know, budgets are only getting less. I I wonder whether it could be more of a talking point TV if you just have really, really sort of high quality, expensive programming in that dedicated slot that maybe could be more sort of, I don't know, family viewing, but maybe I'm totally wrong and that that just wouldn't even work now. There definitely is something in that, like when, I mean, you just always think of coming back from school. Literally, Blue Peter was yeah. the main show. You on Blue Peter, getting home from school, yeah. having that, and then watching news <laughs> round. And the news yeah. would come on, and that was your evening. Yeah, that's absolutely. It. Whereas now, there's almost too much on offer. There's so you're so overwhelmed that you know people just stick to their niches. So I don't know, lots of people will only know the you, their go-to YouTube channel about skateboarding or whatever it is. And I wonder whether, yeah, I don't know, whether you could have, you know, I kind of miss family viewing in, the, in those days of not that many channels. I remember on a Saturday, you know, we would all sit down and watch Wurzel Gummidge or super grand or whatever was that sort of tea time viewing where you think current trends in in kids is heading and obviously you have a lot of books as well uh, you're a very accomplished writer and I've seen a couple there's like one on climate change and a couple of other areas that's obviously quite zeitgeist at the moment mm. but are there any other mm. kind of topics and themes that kids tv and, and kids publishing is really kind of going in all media I think when it comes to kids has a responsibility to make sure that our kids have values of inclusivity diversity have liberal doses of empathy and altruism because you know kids are shaping and forming in the primary years by the secondary years they're done by your 20s the blueprint is so fixed that by your 30s you need therapy to undo it all so it's massively important 
you know, what we subject our kids to in these early formative years. And, you know, they are better at sort of knowing about recycling and climate change than, you know, grown ups, their grown up counterparts, which is great. Because when something strikes a kid in these early years, it goes through to their core and they take it with them for life. You know, the adults that we become are more or less just made in those early years. And I think I only got to my mid-30s before I sort of realised that, that everyone is just such a product of those early years. So, you know, with the books that I do... The first one's all to do with sort of knowledge and education and the the main characters into science. And, you know, I have this thing that I just hate it, that things just seem to dumb down so much. And I think the way forward is to intelligence up because, you know, as an adult, you crave knowledge almost when you're not at school and you realise that, you know, knowledge and intelligence is cool. But sometimes these stereotypes and the things we're subjected to don't necessarily follow that mantra and I know that Blue Peter was often seen as sort of worthy Mm. and quite educational in some camps but actually you know Blue Peter was ahead of the curve you know Blue Peter had Blue Peter appeals before comic relief was even a thing you know Blue Peter was inclusive and diverse it had a Blue Peter garden for kids that didn't have gardens that lived in high rises you know it showed people how people live in sub-saharan africa or in asia and you know all their making stuff was all to do with recycling and upcycling and mend and make do so it was kind of woke before woke it was really ahead of its time and kids tv in general you know where i didn't see that many brown faces on telly at all you know i had Derek griffiths and flo ella benjamin you know And actually, that's how it should be. Children's TV has a real responsibility. Children's books, children's telly. It's more important than grown-up telly because grown-ups are done, whereas children are shaping and forming. And if they all have altruism and empathy, then the world can only be a better place. No matter where they go, they'll want to make sure the world is a better place and then the future's bright. Really well put. Do you think telly's holding up to that quite well at the moment? Or do you think there's some areas that it's that's kind of failing in all it's difficult to know I hope so I sincerely hope so might be a good point to to kind of take a moment to look back over your time in um kids tv presenting so you're on blue peter from 1997 2008 is that is that do I get that correct right quite a long time at the helm and when I was always a big fan of the show and from watching it I was just thought it was so varied like the the stuff you yeah one week to the next week it's just such a mishmash of things and genres and trips yeah events and yeah I wondered kind of what are some of your your biggest highlights for your for yeah your I do too. remember just you saying that makes me remember that on like after just showing the show you know one day we had this machine that was that made snow that makes snow and they filled the blue piece garden with snow and we you know we're pre-recording this thing in the snow in the morning and then we had the wombles in the studio and I do remember like a friend saying well, what did you do today <laughs> I was like wow well, I had a snowball fight and met the wombles and I thought this is how it's gonna be from now on and it really was you know that's why I was in, on it for over 10 years because never a dull moment you travel to so many places and you see so many things and you don't just see them superficially, you go behind the scenes. So I went to so many different countries and continents and I don't know, did diving with sharks and, you know, but it goes from, you know, the ridiculous to the sublime and the glamorous to the, you know, one minute you're interviewing the prime minister, the next minute you're down a sewer, literally. But I remember that the Sunday, one of the Sunday papers, I think it was Sunday Times, did a bucket list of 100 things to do before you die. And the the all, the four of us, Blue Peter presenters, were sort of looking through it and we'd literally, between us, done most of the things. I mean, it is the dream job. But for me, uh, the travel was the highlight. Seeing different places how people live in different countries the appeal filming was just amazing I remember doing a film appeal filming with the Red Cross I was a Red Cross ambassador and we did we did an appeal for Angola where they had nearly 30 years of civil war and every family had a person or a child missing or dead and the Red Cross 
did this tracing project to trace and find people that had gone missing. And it's literally like bringing someone back from the dead, essentially, and returning them to their family. You know, some of these families hadn't seen their kids in years. You know, the kids had grown up almost and had just given up on them. It's like being a detective agency. Mm. And they would find these kids and return them. And, you know, I remember I got to go on a reunification. It was just so overwhelmingly emotional. But, you know, you get to share sort of special moments and see really special, amazing things. But, yeah, I love the variety as well. Yeah, it, it, was, it is the best job in the world. Do you, do you still watch the show? Because I kind of wondered, if you do, what you kind of see the differences between when you were on it and, and how the show kind of runs today. I mean, I dip in and out. And, mm. you know, it does stay true to its values. It really, you know, when Black Lives Matter, they did that amazing piece that went viral. They, you know, still do appeals and lots of foreign filming and, you know, lots of challenges. And, you know, it's a lot harder for them now because in this multi-channel environment and, you know, TV is competing with YouTube and all sorts. But, you know, they are you know moving with the times their latest presenter I think is a YouTuber so you know there's a lot of change on the show as well and yeah I would say it's going from strength to strength. So Blue Peter aside you've been on so many different things over your time presenting I wondered what what are you working on at the moment and what have you got coming down the line? I've got my third book coming out in the congratulations which, yeah, is due to be submitted any time now. I'm literally on deadline at the moment, and that's out in, in September. And then I'm, you know, doing lots of stuff like children's media conference. I've been doing lots of environmental stuff. Tesco, I've been, who, you know, have got a big environmental drive at the moment. Um, I'm in doing stuff with Kew Gardens where I'm an ambassador. I've been doing bits and pieces of little filming of sort of fun cameo stuff. So I just did a thing during lockdown for a drama which is on Apple TV called Invasion where I'm a a news reporter. just did a bit for Mandy where I'm a TV presenter. So just lots of sort of varied bits and pieces really. Sounds like a nice time you can kind of just work on lots of different things and lots of time. Yeah well I'm bound by drop-offs and pickups because I'm I'm determined to be a hands-on mum. So I tend to just do things between the hours of nine and three in general yeah so that I can get my kids from school and watch them grow up and all of that stuff I thought we would end we wrap up our podcasts most times with a little thing well I just ask all of our guests what uh, you've been watching at the moment so I wondered Connie yeah. Mark, what have you been watching at the moment um, I'm currently in the middle of watching Sophie a murder in West Cork which is on Netflix, I, which is a true crime documentary series. I've just finished watching The Terror, which is rather, which I rather enjoyed. It looked um, scary for me. I don't know why. I just was like, this looks really yeah. intense. Yeah, it is quite intense, I have to say. And I know people that did give up midway through. But yeah, I, I, I really enjoyed it. So I, I passed through to the end. Finished watching A Teacher, which is on BBC iPlayer. Yeah. Nice. Good little cohort. So True Crime, The Terror and A Teacher. Yeah. And my, yeah, my recent watches. Thank you so much for joining me on the podcast today. It was lovely to catch up with you and hear your views on kids TV. So thanks. Pleasure. Thank you for listening to the Broadcast News Wrap. I'm Max Goldbart, and you've been listening to a packed show featuring Connie Huck, Helen Bullo, Genevieve Dexter, and Newswrap regulars Jesse Whittock and Hannah Bowler. You can check out all 52 past episodes of the pod on Spotify or iTunes, or on the website via www.broadcastnow.co.uk.